Have you noticed that we're just born to sin? Bruce Springsteen says we're born to run, but we're born to sin. <laughs> Have you ever seen a toddler? If you don't believe we're born to sin, a toddler says, I want that. And the other one says, you can't have it. <laughs> I mean, any of you who are parents, you know what I'm talking about. We get born, and then we just go downhill from there. We start out being not blessed, and as we get older, we just get more and more not blessed. It's, that is unless something happens to interfere along the way. Well, Christianity is an interfering process. It's moving us from being born and raised and living as a not blessed person in this not blessed, non-spiritual world to becoming transformed into a different kind of person, a blessed person who's a citizen of heaven and we learn and make it a heartfelt decision to obey and do what Jesus Christ teaches us. Because Jesus, as God's Son, tells us exactly what God the Father says. If you want to know what God says, just listen to what Jesus says. The Apostle John recorded what Jesus said to the crowds in Jerusalem in John 12, 49 and 50. So Jesus in Jerusalem, and the scripture says, Jesus shouts to the crowds in, Jer in Jerusalem, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I say whatever the Father tells me to say. So if you want to hear God, listen to what Jesus says. So, we choose to make a transformation because we've come to believe Jesus and know that God is smarter than we are and has a better way for us in our lives than we can design. When this happens, we become transformed into an adopted son or daughter of God, and then our citizenship is, is transferred from this not blessed world into the blessed spiritual realm where God lives, the kingdom of heaven. Well, my name's Ron Kramer, and uh, I'm a member of Element Church here, just like you are. And uh, until about a year and a half ago, uh, we, when Jane and I moved to Cheyenne, I was a pastor at a church in Salina, Kansas. And so um, when we went into this transition, the, the team here at Element asked me if I'd help fill in from time to time. And I said, yeah, sure, I'd, I'd love to do that. <clears throat> and so uh, we love Cheyenne. We're really glad to be here. And uh, so welcome to Element Church, anybody who's new. And for you out there online, we're especially glad you decided to tune in today. If you happen to be here or online and, and you're not a, a believer, a, a Jesus follower, or, or maybe you come from some other faith tradition, we're especially glad you're here. Um, it's our, our goal for people to uh, experience life to the fullest, to connect into meaningful relationships and make a lasting impact. You know, Jesus didn't put any qualifications on it when he said, follow me. He just... It says, come along for the journey, listen, and make up your own mind. And so that's, that's what we say. If you need a Bible, by the way, you can get a free Bible from guest services. When you leave today and you go down the hall, guest services is just on your left. If you ask them, they'll be glad to give you a, a free Bible. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the, the Beatitudes that we've been going over for the last couple of weeks... We get to hear what God the Father tells Jesus about how the process of going from not blessed to becoming blessed works. Uh, how if we take Jesus up on his offer to follow me and become blessed, the world is really going to tell us we're not blessed, but we'll know we really are blessed. Okay, you got that? Okay, so, so what is a beatitude? 
Anyway, it's beatitude, kind of a funny word. We don't use it all the time. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines beatitude as a state of utmost bliss. Some synonyms, blissful, happiness, gladness, joy, and my personal favorite, warm fuzzies. So I want you to remember what beatitude means. That's important. An utmost state of bliss, happiness, gladness, joy. The word beatitude comes from the Latin beatus, which means happy and blessed, which was transferred from the Greek makarios, which means happy or fortunate. Here's an example of beatitude in use. This is a quote from the Seattle Times newspaper after a Tim McGraw concert. Quote, from there, the energy level exploded, McGraw and the audience achieving mutual beatitude. So, beatitude is something that makes us feel good. It takes us to a really good place, a place of beatitude. So, as our interim pastor, Derry Long, pointed out two weeks ago, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it was his first major, like, stadium-sized event. Here's a photo of the hill at the top of the Sea of Galilee. It's on the very north end of the Sea of Galilee, and that's where traditionally it's believed that Jesus gave his sermon on the mount. Here's another photo of the hill taken from out in the Sea of Galilee. Now imagine 5,000, 10,000 people on the side of that hill kind of doing a Red Rocks thing with Jesus, you know? He's a rock star. It's at this start of his ministry, and before this, he's been just kind of touring and teaching in small venues, houses, Jewish churches, synagogues, and he's quickly achieved this, this rock star status because thousands of people have been walking for several days from 50 to 60 miles away primarily to see and get, on, get in on the healing that he's been doing. So this is the stage for the Sermon on the Mount. And we're calling this sermon series Not Blessed because while this is Jesus' sermon on Beatitudes, how to find joy and happiness and peace and warm fuzzies, when he starts teaching Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Man, his audience, they would have thought he was completely crazy. All those things are not blessed. I remember the first time I read this sermon I was really confused. How can doing all these things, having all these attitudes, make you blessed? If I actually do these, I, I think I'll be not blessed. And you might be thinking that too, just like Jesus' audience did. In fact, if you do what Jesus, is, Jesus said, you will be not blessed by many people around you. But in the end, God will bless you, and you'll find the attitude. So Jesus wasn't just another Jewish teacher. He, he, he didn't just have a few different opinions than those of the time. Jesus was absolutely countercultural. He was a rebel. He was a radical in his time. And he said, and he still says, follow me in rebellion against how we do insincere religion. He taught how everyone was doing religion wrong. They were trying to obey a bunch of religious rules and do religious things, and they thought that would get them into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, no. Finding the kingdom of heaven is about quality being more important than quantity. He said, 
It's the quality of the relationship with God that you have that gets you into heaven, not the quantity of rules you obey and things you do. His ideas and teachings were so offensive and insulting to many that they got him not blessed right into being killed by his own church. So in, in our time, though, and in our church today, Jesus says the same thing to us. If you truly what, do what Jesus says, you'll become more like him. And the people who are not blessed around you won't particularly like it. On the other hand, here's the upside. God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You're now mine. I've adopted you. Come, live in my world, the kingdom of heaven, which is both here on earth now and later when you die. You are blessed by me. Here's what the scripture actually says leading up to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is Matthew 4, 23 through 25. Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. News about him spread as far as Syria. And people soon began to bring him all who were sick. And whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea, and from east to the Jordan River. So Jesus has all these masses of people following him around. Rock star. Matthew continues in 5 through 10. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, hill, and sat down. And his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And the five or 6,000 people around him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or justice, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, when you just look at this, I got to admit, it all sounds pretty not blessed. Derry covered the first four Beatitudes, so today we're going to go over in detail. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy, and blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. <clears throat> But before we do that, I want to point out that Jesus gives us the Beatitudes not as commands. They're not <clears throat> commands saying, you got to do this. What he's actually doing is giving us a series of progressive steps. These steps are relatively in the order that people go through when they find faith, and then they increase their trust in God as they spiritually mature. So this is important. Their progressive steps, as we review these, see how they build on one another to take us from a place of not being blessed to a place of being greatly blessed and having beatitude. <clears throat> we start with being not blessed and not having peace with ourselves or peace with other people or peace with God. And we feel chaos, and we have drama, and we have angst in our lives because we're living outside of the kingdom of God. And as we progress through these steps, we find the beatitude that only God can provide. So uh, then when we get there, though, we become persecuted, or, or at least criticized, by those who are still not blessed because we've become different and we're trying to show them the good thing we've found. And, and sometimes people don't want to hear it. 
Let's look at how this process of going from being not blessed to beatitude works, this progression. <clears throat> blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We can't be fixed until we realize we're broken. We come to realize that we don't have peace with ourselves. We realize we don't have peace with others, and, and we're out of whack with God. We're poor in spirit. This is the first step toward moving toward the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. We're sad when we come to understand and realize that we're really kind of broken. But then we're comforted when we learn that God's willing to fix us. He wants to help us. We come to understand and, and we regret the impact we've had on ourselves and other people. And the fact that we've, we've really disappointed God. He had kind of good plans for us and we know we've kind of got off track. But, but when we understand that God's willing to work with us, no matter what we've done, no matter how far off track we got, with Jesus, it can all be fixed and we can be made right again. That provides us with comfort. Blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. We humbly accept God's help that he offers by accepting and following Jesus, and we live forever. Using our meekness that Derry talked about last week, we, we humble ourselves before God and we apologize for how we've been and how we are. And we agree to follow Jesus as our way and our truth and our life. We accept his lordship over our own and we start going against the culture of sin that's in our lives and that we live with. If we do this, we'll be saved and we'll be in the group that inherits the earth and lives with God forever. You know, when I first became a Christian, it took a while for that to sink in. I'm, I'm going to live forever. If you're a Jesus follower and you, and you really got this stuff in your heart, you're going to die and then boop, you're going to be awake again. You're going you're gonna to go from this place to the other good place in another dimension somewhere, heaven. And, and, and that's a reality. Paul, the apostle Paul, that's why he doesn't use the word death. He talks about people going to sleep because he knows it's, it's not permanent. It's just a, a, a long nap. But we're, when we die, our reality is, is we're going to die. All of a sudden, we're going to be somewhere else that's really good if we're a Christ follower. So we, uh, we get to live forever, and that's really good. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled or satisfied. After this happens to us, we start wanting what God wants righteousness and justice, and we trust God to provide it. We start seeing things the way God sees things, and we want righteousness and justice for all the wrong and the hurt that we see going on around us. And, and we become filled or satisfied once we trust that God is really in control of stuff and that he will make everything right in his time and his way. When, when we really, really get good with that, we, we are filled and we are satisfied. We continue our progression to spiritual maturity and beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. We show mercy and forgiveness to others so we can get it from God. We come to understand and appreciate just how much mercy and forgiveness God has for us. But he says, we can't have it until we give it to other people. Giving mercy and forgiveness, it unloads the weight of resentment and anger we carry around from being hurt by other people. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. 
Forgiving others cleans our heart to find peace with God and peace with other people. Having shown mercy and forgiveness to everyone in that previous step, knowing that we've received it from God, we're no longer angry and resentful toward other people. And there's nothing in our heart that blocks our relationship with God. Our hearts are pure, and we, we now see and we feel God's presence, and we have peace in our lives. We've reached beatitude with God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. We want to share this thing we've found, this, this peace process with others, so they can have this sense of beatitude too. Having been adopted by God, at this point, we're feeling really good. We, we don't have any guilt anymore. We're not angry at anybody. Our heart's been cleaned up. We're secure in who we are. We're not threatened by anything or anybody. And we're at peace. And, and, and we want others to know about and find what we've found. And so we join God at his work of sharing this process of beatitude with other people. Finally, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're attacked, or at least criticized, by those we're trying to help. But God rewards us for the trying. People who are still not blessed resent the fact that we're a little or a lot different than we used to be. We're, we're pretty happy, and, and we're trying to show them something good, the way, the truth, and the life. And, and they let us know, they kind of resent the fact that they're still kind of captives to chaos and drama and struggles and stuff, and, and they see that we're kind of free. Our reward is that we've actually found the kingdom of heaven Jesus offers us right here on earth. Be attitude. Be attitude. Let these be our attitudes. So you see, the beatitudes take us from being not blessed in the world to being blessed and in the kingdom of God. Not blessed in chaos to blessed in a state of beatitude. Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount in Aramaic, and uh, that was the language that most common people used. Hebrew, which a lot of people um, think the, the Jewish people speak, Hebrew was really mostly used by just the Jewish religious leaders and in Jewish ceremony. How many people here have seen Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ? Yeah, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't seen that movie, Mel Gibson directed it, he's not in it, except, except for one shot. There's a shot of some feet in the dirt. That, those are Mel Gibson's feet. But uh, if you haven't seen that movie, I'd encourage you to, to rent and watch The Passion of the Christ. Because in it, a whole movie almost is, is spoken in Aramaic, which is the language he, Jesus used when he delivered the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, so when Jesus says blessed in the Beatitudes, he used the Aramaic word tovehan, tovehan. It means happy, contented, delighted, fortunate, kind of like Beatitude. This is why blessed at the start of each Beatitude was originally translated happy. Happy are those who are poor in spirit. Happy are. But when it went from Greek to Latin to English, it became blessed. But Jesus' intent is clearly to tell us how to get to the state of beatitude. That's why they're called the beatitudes. Our first beatitude this morning that Jesus says will make us happy, blessed, is based on God's spiritual principle that what you give out you get back. It's called the, the principle of reciprocity. What you give, you get. Here's a good 
scriptural example of this principle. It's Luke 16, 31, 37, and 38. And this is Jesus speaking. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will all come back against you. Forgive others, and you will be forgiven. Give, and you will receive. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. It's this, it's this principle that what you give out, you get back. So here's the attitude number five on giving mercy. Remember, we're in a process, and, and the one, the beatitude before this, we started seeing things like God does. So we hungered and thirst for righteousness. We see the need for justice, but we can't fix it. And we come to trust that God is sovereign and that he will fix things. And when that happens, our need for justice is satisfied. So Matthew 5, 7 goes on to say, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. In Aramaic, it's tuvehan, happy, contented, fortunate, are you who have rachma, pure love. You will therefore receive rachma, pure love. The message, which is a paraphrased version of the Bible, where Eugene Peterson, who was a pastor and a linguist of ancient language, he tries to kind of give us a meaning here, and he says, you're blessed when you care. At the moment of being full of care for others, you find yourself cared for. If you think about it, the central issue of this beatitude is really, what is mercy? Well, if we look at the other translations, it's also called pure love or being full of care for another. Mercy is all about forgiveness. The only person who needs mercy is a person who's done something to you that you feel merits revenge or punishment, and, and, and they deserve it, you know? But instead, you're going to give them mercy, which is sure close to exhibiting pure love or having care for this person who's, who's wronged you. Regardless of the exact translation, the intent is to not hold something against another person. And that's forgiveness. God says through Jesus in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, if you forgive other people, then when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Having unforgiveness, which is a lack of mercy, it's like drinking poison and expecting it to hurt the other person. Carrying anger and resentment around only hurts us. Forgiving others and showing mercy when they don't deserve it shows that we trust God. We give our hurt and our anger and our resentment for other people to him. And we trust God that he's going to make it right in some way. And if punishment's deserved, He's the one who's going to do the punishment. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 12, 19, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. When we give mercy to others, we get mercy from God. Our next beatitude in this sequence is about being pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The Aramaic is tuvehan, happy, contented, fortunate. Tuvehan are you who have dadkin, which is a completely purified mind. You will nakazan, comprehend Allah, the invisible, the invisible source of creation. You're blessed. The message says you're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. Okay, so again, we're in this progressive process. We've just given mercy and forgiveness to everyone, and the weight's off. And, and we know we're also forgiven and free. And so now we have dadkin, a completely purified mind. 
a clean heart, and we're put right with God. We have no anger or resentments to block our relationship with God. We, we can now knock a zun, comprehend, or see God's hand, Allah, the invisible source of creation. We see God at work in everything and everyone around us. We don't have anything blocking our relationship. We see and trust God in, in everything, and we have peace and joy pretty much regardless of the circumstance. This is what the Apostle Paul talked about when he's in jail and he's in chains, and he says, oh, I've learned to, to have peace in all circumstances. You know, when I'm hungry and when I'm full, when I'm in jail, when I'm free, it's always good with me. That's, be that's beatitude. And, and when we've gone through this process and we're cleaned out, we're not holding anything against anyone, we know we're right with God, man, we're free. We've got beatitude. Psalm 24, 3 to 5, puts it this way. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with their Savior. That's beatitude. So, let's recap today's lesson. The Beatitudes, Jesus' first major public event, he teaches his disciples, the crowd, and us how to move from being not blessed through this progressive series of, of attitudes to the point we find faith and trust in, in God. And, and Jesus says, if we do that, we'll probably be not blessed by the people we've kind of left behind in the world as we've moved toward and into the kingdom of heaven. And eventually, as we work at these attitudes and we work our way through this process, we end up in beatitude, our utmost bliss, happiness, gladness. And we have a lot of warm fuzzies, which is good. That's blessed in any language. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you. We praise you. You've given us a process. You've, you've shown us, Lord, how to go from being not blessed to being blessed. You've shown us how to move through this chaotic life of sin that we live in to understanding who we are, who you are, and then finding peace with who we are, with other people, and with you. And Lord, then you, you say we'll see things your way if we'll just trust you. And you'll make everything right. And then we feel really good, Lord. You give us this, this feeling and this, this state of being called beatitude. And, and, and it's good, Lord. And, and we want everyone to have it. And when we try to tell them and explain what's happened to us, they, they don't get it, Lord. And, and some of them do get it, but sometimes they resent it and, and they, they persecute us. But you say, if we'll try anyway, you'll bless us. Thank you for that. Thank you for helping us understand. In your name, Jesus, amen.